how to make and attach quilt binding specifically for a mini quilt. I, I still have stacks of mini quilts, don't judge me, that need to be bound so I can finish decorating the rest of the walls here in my home sewing studio. But we'll take a second to say hi to some friends. I'm coming to you all from my home sewing studio in North Central Florida, where it is a gorgeous sunny day. It's been freezing here, believe it or not, freezing. We were 23 degrees, 26 degrees, 29 degrees a couple days ago. And so I'm glad that it is now finally back up into the 50s and 60s. All right, let's see who we got tuning in here. Hey, Carol, tuning in from West Virginia. <clears throat> um, awesome, Patricia is tuning in from Tucson, Arizona. Janelle is in the house from snowy central Illinois, she says. Marilyn is in the house from Melbourne, Florida, just south of us, and she says lots of sunshine here. That is for sure. Let's see. Hi, Margie, tuning in from Wisconsin. We got Nancy from Massachusetts. It's in as well. Um, Rob Gra, I can never remember who that is with their username, Rob G-R-A. She says, wow, Vanessa, your, head, your hair is get, getting so long. Nice. My hair grows super duper fast. Last year, y'all remember, I probably had like short hair, like short, short hair. My hair grows super duper fast. And when it's cold and dry and not as humid, you know the Dominican in me has to hit it with the blow dryer. So that's where we are today with the blow dried long melena, like we would say. Okay. Um, hi, Gisela tuning in from Sweden. Awesome. And Patricia is in the house from Los Angeles. Oh, we got Robin from South Africa tuning in as well. That is awesome. Okay. All right. So looks to me like the technology is working well. Audio and everything looks good. So let's get started. This is the mini quilt. Those of you that were in my Clammy Quilt Club last year, was it even last year? Oh my gosh, the years have just like jumbled themselves up. But I, this was one of the mini quilts that I did using that um, Drunkard's Path kind of shape. It's a little bit different, but I used my friend Latifa Safir's um, Clammy Ruler. So we made different mini quilts during that, qu that quilt club that we did last year. And so I want to get these bound. You can see this is Actually, one of my friends, Sarah Lawson's fabrics, it has little horseshoes on it on the back. It's an old print. And so I grabbed some fabric from my stash. I have bright orange here. I know some of y'all might think it won't match, but trust me, my mini quilt walls have so many different colors. I love another pop of color on the border here. I was looking to see if I had like a black and white, either striped or heavily polka dotted fabric, and I couldn't find one in my stash. I'm sure y'all know how that feels. It's like, I know I have a polka dotted black and white fabric here somewhere. I just couldn't find it. So we're going to go with a funky orange. Since the walls in my studio are this pale, pale aqua, uh, I really like the way that this as a border will pop. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. And um, let's go ahead and switch to my over the shoulder camera shot so that we can start talking about the strips and all that. Now, binding is kind of a touchy subject, I feel like, among quilters. If you've been a quilter for a long time, chances are you have like your way of doing quilt binding. There's so many different methods. You can do flange ones. You can add an extra trim. You can do like where the backing is your binding. You can attach it to one side by machine and then hand sew it to the back. I know that's a popular method. I do that a lot, but I like the hand sewing part. I also like to knit and crochet and do stuff you know, the slow kind of stitching uh, type of craft. So I often will do that. But this is a mini quilt. Ain't nobody got time for that. We're not going to deal with hand sewing it. So we're going to actually make the binding and I'm going to attach it by machine, both to the front and I'm going to flip it to the back and stitch it into place by machine as well. Because I want to get these done. I need to get these posted up on my wall. Now, here are a couple. And you may be wondering, well, what exactly constitutes a mini quilt? A mini quilt can be anything. It could be this big and you throw it up there. It could be a little mug rug. It could be a coaster size or a placemat size. Some of these were little lonely solo blocks that I had worked together from different quilt clubs and things like that, showing students how to make, uh, you know, how to work the techniques of putting the patchwork block together, but I wasn't planning on making an entire quilt featuring the same type of blocks. So I just took the blocks, on some of these, you can see that I quilted it, so there is batting in here. And you can probably tell that I use a pretty thin batting, especially if I have plans to put this up on a wall for a wall hanging, or for, in my case, my mini quilt hanging uh, wall, I would say. 
So Darcy's asking, what do you do with a mini quilt? Yeah, it's just like decor. You can also make one if it's like a really cute block and maybe it goes with your kitchen or your dining room decor. You can use it as a, um, a placemat, like for the center, like a table topper to put a bowl on or a main dish or something like that. Anything. It's just a chunk of fabric that has a little bit more body to it because we added it batting, okay? Now, if you wanna quilt it, that's what we call a quilt sandwich. You have the quilt top, which is whatever the patchwork design is. Then we have a layer of batting in here. And then we have quilt or the fabric backing. So those three layers are what we call a quilt sandwich. So you can use um, batting scraps if you have from larger quilts. You know, oftentimes we make maybe a baby quilt and we don't end up using the whole chunk of batting. You can use scrap pieces to put in between, and on this one you can see it better. This is one block, and then I have some quilt batting here, and then I have the backing fabric as well. This one has not been quilted, and I'll probably just end up doing some hand quilting just in the center here, okay? One thing to know, and this is gonna help determine how much quilting or how little quilting you need to do to finish off your mini quilts, especially if you wanna put them up on a wall like I do, is to read the manufacturer's instructions for the quilt batting that you're using. It will tell you that the stitches need to be eight inches apart or 13 inches apart. It'll give you like a minimum spacing. And so, for example, if I'm working, say this batting says, uh, on the packaging it says, the stitches need to be a minimum 10 inches apart, okay? Well, if you measure the block itself, in my case, I look and I see, okay, this is a 12 and a half inch block. So from edge to edge, is 12 and a half inches. So I could probably get away with it just because it's not gonna be a quilt that's gonna be washed and washed and washed for a wall hanging. But otherwise, from the side base stitches here to 10 inches over, I need to put in some type of stitching. And it could be by hand or by machine, but what that helps to do is to kind of stabilize that batting inside so that when you're washing the quilt, you don't have that huge of an expanse of just loose batting in there that can then ad get agitated as it's in the wash. And then um, if that's ever happened to you, you know what I'm talking about, where like the batting itself would just like wad up into chunks because it wasn't anchored down in that minimum stitch spacing that the packaging called for. So think about that too. This one, I mean, it's a 12 and a half inch block. I can probably even just do some stitch in the ditch around the center square and that will meet the requirements because then I'll have stitching from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, right? So I break up the full width of the block with some type of stitching and then boom, I'm done. And that's a quick and easy way to do it. Again, I could probably even just stitch like a heart or something super simple here. And because that's less than that distance away from all the sides, I would be good to go. So think about that. Those are kind of little quickie tips and ways to cut corners, especially if you're making a wall hanging mini quilt, like specifically to hang up, okay? Um, Joan is asking, do you have a video tutorial on how to make a mini quilt? I actually have several. If you type in in YouTube, just type in Crafty Gemini mini quilt. I have one for a fun, trying to see, a turnstile block. Actually, I'm going to walk over there and pull it off the wall. Because once you watch the video on how I hang up my mini quilts, you'll be able to see exactly how I do the whole, whole thing. And this is just stuck on. Oh, this is a smaller one, so I'll have to pull it off but that's okay. Let me just pop this off the wall so that you can see, because this is one that I show you how to make the quilt block. I also show you how to layer the three, um, the three layers up to make your quilt sandwich. I show you how to hand quilt it, how to bind it, and how to um, hang it up. So it's like a full mini quilt series, and this is it. Many of you have probably made it. Yeah, that's it. The turnstile mini quilt. So I show you how to prep and cut your fabrics to make the little block, layering up the quilt sandwich, and then you can see I just outlined the design with some big stitch hand quilting. They're just longer, more spaced out stitches with a 12 weight cotton thread. Then I made the binding, and then I use a 3M command strip method um, by gluing these two little chunks of cardstock or like a sturdy paper, and then I just peeled off the two little poster sized things from the wall but I have plenty more, so I'll stick it back up there. And that is how I make and hang my mini quilt. So this is a turnstile quilt block, and we'll put a link in the chat. Is that what you were doing? Great. So we'll put a chat in the box, or a link in the chat box, so that y'all can watch that tutorial. But if you just do a YouTube search for Crafty Gemini mini quilt, all my mini quilt project or video tutorials will pop up. Okay, awesome. 
Let's see. Oh, um, Rob Griss says, I'm drinking a hot drink out of my clammy mug. Awesome. Now, Deborah says, can you use old cotton sheets for backing? I have seen that. I've never done that. Uh, I just know that the cotton sheets that I have had my hands on, it's a different thread count, the weave, than what I'm used to using with uh, like designer quality uh, quilt cot uh, quilting cottons. So I've heard of people using it. Um, I've never done it personally, so I can't really speak to it from a personal experience. Okay. Okay, so anyways, these are ones, obviously this one needs to be trimmed. I need to figure out what I'm going to do here and then bind that one. But this is the one that I was thinking of binding today with y'all here on camera. So the first thing that we're going to do is basically measure. You can measure outright with a measuring tape or with a ruler, but I basically want to figure out what is the perimeter of my quilt so that I know how many binding strips should I cut out. The worst thing is when you cut one binding strip too few <laughs> and you're like do 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 happily stitching it on and you're like no then you have like this entire gap because you didn't cut enough strips and then you have to undo stitches attach another strip it's a nightmare it just breaks up the flow so let's go ahead and i actually already cut out two strips now we cut the strips in varying widths this is another one of those areas where like quilters have their very very specific tried and true loved method for making their quilt bindings I always tend to cut my binding strips two and a quarter inches wide. Oftentimes in books and tutorials, whatever, you'll see two and a half. That's just a little bit too chunky for me because I end up with a narrower binding on the front and a wider one on the back. And I think that has a lot to do, well, I know it does, because I sew really scant quarter inch seam allowances. So I find that a two and a quarter inch wide strip works best for me. So it's something that you're going to want to audition and kind of try out. If you want to make some mini quilts to put up on your studio or sewing space wall, this is going to be great you know, make one and bind it with a two and a quarter inch uh, binding strip and then make another one two and a half and kind of figure out what works best for you. Okay. Um, let's see. Prudence says, oh, hey, Prudence, thanks for tuning in. Joan says, thanks, Vanessa. I'll check that out. I would do this. Uh, would I do the same thing if I was making it for my kitchen table? Absolutely. Um, you obviously would want to be using, well, I guess it kind of depends on what you want to put on top of it, but if you're just going to use it as like a table topper or a placemat for a bowl or a platter or something, yeah, you just make, you're just making another little mini quilt the same as we would, um, throw these up on the wall. Okay. Um, Nancy says, can you use washed and unwashed fabrics together? Well, that's a great question. A lot of people always ask that about prepping your fabrics. If you look nowadays, designer quality quilting cottons are such great quality. I rarely ever have uh, a situation where the darker colors or more vibrant colors will bleed out. And so I don't really ever pre-wash my quilting cotton fabrics. Now, if I'm making garments, that's a whole different story. I always pre-wash garments okay, or fabric that I'm going to use for making garments, okay? Because I want the clothes to fit. But in quilting, I almost never pre-wash my fabrics. And if you think about it, when we look at the pre-cuts, you know, the five inch squares, 10 inch squares, those two and a half inch strip roll packs, jelly rolls, honey buns, you know, depending on all those that the different uh, fabric manufacturers are putting out these days, on those, they're not pre-washed and they specifically tell you oftentimes on the packaging not to pre-wash those. So if that is the exact same fabric that they're selling me in a quilt shop yardage of it, that tells me that I'm probably not going to have too much of an issue um, with shrinkage or with colors bleeding if it's a good, you know, designer quality quilting cotton. Okay, so great question. For me, I would say yes, because I would definitely have fabrics in my stash that have been washed, and I have some that haven't, and I will never think twice about putting them two together. Okay, I will always do it every time if I like it. Okay, so I cut my strips. I cut just two strips the width of the fabric, and if you're new to quilting, I'll show you what that means. You know, when you buy yardage, so say you buy half of a yard of fabric, they measure half a yard this way, but the width is the same across the entire bolt of fabric. That's what I mean. So usually there's a fold down here, and up here you'll have the salvage edges of your fabric. I already trimmed those off because I'm getting ready to sew these two strips together. So if I don't want to take a measuring tape, I can just audition this by running the strip along the edge, it's not, I'm not going like right, right on the edge. I just want to see roughly, do I have enough fabric to make my way around? And if I open up the second strip, let me see, zoom out some. There. 
if I put these two together, you can see that going around it, I should have plenty. Okay. So that tells me I should be okay with two strips. All right. If you're ever not sure and you're working on a really big quilt and the dimensions are kind of a weird number or it's more rectangular in shape, if you have the fabric, just cut yourself an extra strip to be safe. Okay. For me, I think I'll be able to get away with it with these two strips. So I'm going to sew these two strips together. Let me kickstart my iron here. And this fabric was a little wrinkled in my stash. So let me press it real quick. All right. Just a quick press. And another tip too, is if you're not going to pre-wash your fabrics, but you feel some kind of way about using them without washing them, if you steam your fabrics, you're adding heat and moisture. So if you're worried about the shrinkage, I would say nowadays with good quality fabric, the stuff is only shrinking between one and 3% anyway. So you're not really going to, you know, it's not like you're going to make a quilt and then wash and the whole thing's going to shrivel up. But if you steam the fabric prior to cutting it out, to cutting out your pieces and stuff like that, then you are adding heat and moisture and that's going to help you pre-shrink it just a little. So it's kind of like a, a little hack, a cheater method to not have to run an entire wash and to still add some heat and moisture to pre-shrink it a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, Faelene is asking, can you share what equipment is holding your phone? So I'm not using a phone. Um, we have cameras set up on tripods here in the studio. Okay. Oh my gosh, Becky's so funny. She says, I've seen the mini quilts in your studio and I love them. Until today, it never occurred to me to make one. Oh, absolutely. If you don't have time to make massive, you know, bed size quilts, mini quilts are like the potato chip of the quilt world. You know, you make one, you're like, yeah, that was fun. I, I practiced some cutting, some piecing accurately, and you basically make an entire quilt, but in a project that you can make in a day. Okay. All right. So we have our two strips here. The way that I like to say this, and I'm going to sew these two strips together to make one long continuous quilt binding strip is that I place the first one in front of me, pretty side facing up and like a, a letter I, a capital letter I. Then I take the second strip that I want to attach to it and I'm going to place it on top of this one, but notice it's pretty side facing down. And then I match up the raw edges on the side and on the bottom. So basically from these two strips, what I end up doing is creating a backwards L and that's always how I how I remember it in my head. Okay. Uh, let's see. Then we're going to grab a pin. We're going to stitch the same way that these are oriented. And it, sometimes it can be a little tricky to remember, but once you have it like a backwards L, I always then remember, <clears throat> excuse me, that my stitches need to go from the top right corner to the bottom left. Okay. If you stitch this and if you orient it this way and you stitch from here to here, you're not going to get a continuous strip and I'll show you what happens. If you can never remember it, or maybe it's been a while since you made a quilt and you need to bind it and you're just like, what did Vanessa say? Put a pin there to kind of signify where you are going to be stitching. And I feel like this is a little bit bright. You might not a little bit darker there so you can see. So say I'm going to stitch from here to here. You place it there and then you flip this back onto itself and see, hey, what's going to happen if I do that? And you're going to get a V. It doesn't go into one solid continuous line of binding. So I know, hey, that pin is in the wrong place. And I'm glad that I auditioned it because otherwise my stitches would end up in the wrong place. So remember that it goes from top right to bottom left. And to audition that, if I run my pin in that direction to signify where my stitches are going to be, you will see that along that diagonal, once I flip this back to the pretty side, yes, then I will get a nice continuous binding strip. So I know exactly where I have that pin is where I need to stitch. All right. So we're going to stitch from here to here. Now the pin is in place, but we don't want that pin in place. I'm going to scoot it over closer to one of the corners. And I usually will put a pin either here or here and here because I need room to draw my line, that diagonal line. Some people use, um, there's like different little, where's my marker here? There are different tools that you can attach to the bed of your sewing machine that have like dashed arrows with seam allowances and stuff. 
But if I'm just attaching one or two strips, I always find that just drawing a quick line is simple enough. So I just place my ruler so that the diagonal runs from top right corner to bottom left. And then I'm just going to follow the edge of my ruler to draw that line. And that line that I just drew is where I'm going to stitch. So it's an easy visual to see. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Donna's asking a good question. She says, when and why would someone do a hangover when adding to the strips, or should it never be done? What I'm thinking you're talking about, Donna, is when you see people go like this, and they just go like a little bit over and a little bit over, and that is the exact same method that I'm doing here, but by overhanging it, it just allows you to more easily see where the intersection is between the two strips. So like it would still be from top right corner to bottom left. It would just be where the two fabrics meet, to where the two fabrics meet. So you just end up with a little bit more waste. But if you find that that's helpful for you to see it, that works too. I just have a thing with straight edges. <laughs> so I need to line mine up exactly on the raw edges, just how I work. But yes, that little overhang, you often see it used and, um, and that's the reason. Okay, so we're gonna grab our little Juki LB5020 little workhorse machine. I'm going to leave my needle in the center position, right? Because I'm not following a seam allowance or a guide. What I'm following is the line that I just drew. So if I leave my needle in the center position, I'll easily be able to follow the line right down the center with my stitching. All right, so we're gonna start there. And I'm using about a 2.2 stitch length. Anywhere between two and 2.5 should work fine. I'm gonna take a back stitch. And then let's keep stitching straight on the line. Eh, you can back stitch at the end. You don't really have to. I mean, all this stuff is going to get folded and caught up anyways, but if you feel like you want to, feel free. Okay. So this is what we got our backwards L, and we stitched it, okay, from top right to bottom left corner. Great. Double check it. When I go like this, ta-da! Beautiful binding strip. Now I need to get rid of this excess though. So, where's my other ruler? Where are all my rulers? Here it is. Do y'all hear those roosters? I'm sure y'all hear those roosters coming through on my microphone. Okay. So we're going to get rid of the excess bulk. And all I'm going to do is take the quarter inch line on my ruler and place it on the stitch line or the line that I drew right there. So if that line is on the quarter inch mark of my ruler, I know that from there to the edge of my ruler is a quarter inch seam allowance that I want to keep. We'll leave that in there. The rest of this little corner needs to be trimmed off. So I'm just going to follow along the edge of my ruler with my rotary cutter, cut that off. I have my quarter inch seam and there it is. We're going to press it open. Now I'm just using my Martelli roundabout mat. Y'all know that this thing comes with the cutting mat on top that rotates. And when I take that off, I can use the ironing board that's underneath. So that's what that is. And we can put a link in the chat box. We do, I think we have one. Yeah, we have a couple more in stock and we stay restocking them. So you can, if you ever are trying to order it uh, from our, from our site and it's out of stock, just add yourself to the wait list. Now I just press that seam open to help reduce the bulk. And I'm going to take my handy dandy Taylor's clapper and that just helps set it super duper flat. Okay. Boom. So that's what you get. All right. Now we're going to go through and I'm going to fold this in half. So pretty side face down. I'm folding it in half lengthwise. I'm just going to take my iron and press the whole strip in half this way. Some people leave like the first 10 inches open without a fold. Like I said, you're going to find the bestest way for you to do it. Uh, I'm just sharing with you when I'm doing it fast, when it is a mini quilt, when it's a baby quilt, a quick gift quilt, something that's real simplified and, and simple, easy, quick. I just want to get it done. This is how I do my binding. Okay. Move that out the way. Karen says it's nice to know she's not the only one that misplaces her tools girl it don't matter and then you get a bigger table and a bigger table and you just have more lost tools on the bigger table it just 
There's no winning. I've been at this for 15 years and it's the same thing. <laughs> and then you end up buying twos and threes of everything. And you very rarely will have access to all of the doubles and the, and the, and the triples that you have of these tools, but they're here somewhere, right? If I spend a couple minutes, I know I'll be able to find it. <laughs> all right. Hey, Jamie, thanks for tuning in. All right. I'm almost to the other side. Just make sure that when you fold this, you try to keep that strip as consistent as possible because that will help you get a nicer, cleaner finish, right? Because when we align the raw edge of our binding strip with the edge of our quilt sandwich, if the binding strip is crooked, then you're aligning it crooked. That means you're going to be stitching it into place crooked. And then you know how it is in quilting. One little thing will compound itself across multiple seams, across your whole project. And what looks to be you know, uh, not that big of a little bobble in your stitching, it'll definitely show up down the line. Okay. Boom. So that's done. Thank you, Leslie. She says, I love your lives. I'm glad you're tuning in. I hope you pick up some tips here. All right. So now we get our mini quilt. <clears throat> it's up to you where you want to start and stop and finish. The way that I do it tends to be a pretty seamless finish because we end up um, closing up the edge on whatever edge we start and stop on with uh, a miter join similar to the one that we just did to put these two strips together, okay? So, let's see. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to take one end of my binding strip and I just place the quilt the way that I'm going to orient it. So in this case, if it's a mini quilt, I think I want to have it like this. Let's see. No, I think I'm going to hang it like this. The curve's going this way. Yeah, I like that. So if I position it the way that it's going to visually be up on the wall, then that means that this is the bottom. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, I place the binding strip on here so that the raw edges, right, as I folded it, are aligned raw edge of my binding strip to raw edge of the quilt. And as, this is, of course, when you get to this step, assuming that you've already squared up your quilt top. So when you trim it and you're trimming away the excess, make sure that you use a 90 degree angle of your square or rectangular rulers to cut and trim th things up, okay? Because if it's not square, you're not going to be able to attach it square. Okay, so like this one, for example, hasn't been stitched across here yet, and that's probably why I hadn't trimmed it, but I would take typically a larger square ruler, and then I would follow it along the edge of my rotary cutter, making sure to do this on all four corners so that you get those nice square 90 degree angle corners as you're trimming up your quilts, okay, or mini quilts in this case. All right, so instead of starting on a corner, I like to start somewhere in the middle. And what I do is I extend this about two thirds of the way across, make sure it's nice and straight along the bottom. You can use pins or clips, up to you. Usually when I'm working with bulkier fabrics or more layers of material, I'll go to the clips, but you can also use pins, that's fine too. So when we lay it like this, I don't start stitching here flat. I like to leave myself about at least, and <laughs> if you've been watching me for years, you've hear me change this up every time. Sometimes I say like five or six inches. Sometimes I end up doing five or six inches and I run too tight when I come to join the opposite end. So really you can leave like 10 to 13 inches, especially on a bigger quilt that has a longer edge. You can leave a ton, but you do want to leave yourself the tail there too, right? Don't just go like this and start down here. Start sewing down here, but leave yourself that extended tail. Does that make sense? And so that's why it's important to have, you know, an extra strip or two or whatever you might need for the, um, the binding strip. At this point, I'm just going to swing this across here and make sure that I'm going to have enough to come around. So you see how if I come around, then I still have this good bit. So we're in business. I have plenty to work with. Okay. So I'm going to place a couple clips here. We match the raw edges. I'm going to start sewing down here. Leave yourself a tail and a loose bit before you start. And then let me walk you through how I'm going to stitch this because it's going to be tricky to see on the sewing machine, but I want you to hear what it's going to what the steps are going to be first and then I'll show you on the sewing machine. Okay. 
Um, Barbara has a great question. She says, did you sew around the edge of the quilt? Should that be done to all quilts? So she's asking about this basting here. Now this mini quilt, I actually quilted on my long arm frame and that is the reason that it is basted. Okay, because on a, on a long arm frame, I based around the sides and then I quilt inside of the project and then you advance the quilt layers and then you base down the side again to keep everything nice and taut and square. Okay, but if this was a mini quilt that I was just, I quilted or finished up on a regular sewing machine, I would still baste an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch in from the outer edges because if not, all this is one big chunk of fabric and there's no patchwork pieces there. There's no intersections. So this literally would just be a piece of fabric that I could just like lift up and you don't want to end up with any puckers or pleats as you're quilting the project. So it's always good to smooth things out, whether you hand baste it or machine baste it around the edges to keep all your patchwork and layers flat. All right. So great question. Let's see. Um, Inquisitive is asking, <clears throat> can you discuss a little bit about binding off squares with rounded corners? So if you're going to be binding a quilt that maybe you've trimmed off the corners so that they're not square 90 degree angle corners, they're just round, you would need to cut your uh, binding strips on the bias. You might could get away with the crosswise grain strips because they do have a little bit of stretch, but it's going to depend on how deep the curve is. If it's like a slight curve like down here, just like a little bit like that, I could probably get away with the crosswise grain cut strips like these. Um, if it's a deeper arch, right, it's more of a rounded corner, then you're going to need to cut it on the bias because the fabric itself, especially if you cut this along the lengthwise grain, there will be no give in the fabric grain line for you to be able to get around there. And it's going to be a puckering nightmare. <laughs> Let's just say that. <clears throat> okay. So we're coming straight down. I'm going to put another clip here. Again, there's a million different ways to do this. I'm just going to share with y'all what mine is. So at the sewing machine, I'm going to start here and I'm going to back stitch to secure it. Okay. I'm going to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance and I'm going to stitch straight down. Before I get to the end, notice I said I'm going to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance. That's going to be my seam allowance, meaning from the edge of my quilt here to where my stitches are going to be, it will be a quarter of an inch, something like this. Okay. So whatever that seam allowance is, as you work your way down to the next corner, you want to stop that same distance up as well. So if I'm stitching, 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 I'm going to stop here. And how do I know that that is where it is? Because I'm looking at this edge. If I'm stitching here, 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 I'm going to stop a quarter of an inch up from the edge. I can't see the edge through this binding strip, but if I glance over here, I can see where it is. Does that make sense? So if this is a quarter of an inch up where that little dot is, you can see that the distance from here to where my little knitting needle is, is that quarter of an inch that I want to stop shy from. Okay, so I'm going to stitch, stitch, stitch. I'm going to stop with the needle down in my project a quarter of an inch up. Okay, from the bottom quilt edge. And then I'm gonna lift my presser foot up. I'm gonna turn this and I'm gonna stitch straight off at a 45 degree angle. Okay, from here. And then once I stitch straight off the edge, we are going to pivot our project, reinsert it under the sewing machine. And because I'll have stitched off there, I will easily be able to now take my binding strip. I throw it away from me and then swing it back to me. So first you throw away, it's going to go up like this and you'll see that it's folded at a 45 degree angle. Okay. And then you're going to hold right there and then you're going to fling it right back towards you so that the fold here is then going to be aligned with the raw edge of your quilt. So all those layers will then be flush. Okay. And then when you have it like this, look where the binding strip is. It's coming straight back down this bottom edge, which we also need to bind. So it's in the perfect spot for you to then go back into the sewing machine, back stitch here and continue stitching down. And then you just stitch, stitch, stitch the same thing. You stop again, a quarter of an inch up, stop with the needle down, pivot the project, stitch straight off the corner, reinsert it, throw away and fling back. And you're going to do that same, those same steps on all four of the corners because that's how we're going to end up with mitered corners. Okay. Those nice little neat corners that you see on quilts. You see how that is like that. 
45 degree angle is where you see the seam, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. So let's scoop my Martelli mat stuff out of the way. Let me not trip over my cords. I need room here. I'm gonna bring my sewing machine into the mix. I think you can see it there, good. Let me drink some water. <clears throat> um, Stephanie was asking, what's a cross wire? She says, I'm very new and I'm learning to sew in quilting. So I think you mean cross wise grain. That has to do with the grain lines and what direction the threads of the fabric are running to, through. Um, if you do a little search, you can find a ton of info, like just even a tutorial on YouTube that'll walk you through what lengthwise grain is and crosswise grain. I usually go over it every time I'm cutting something or showing you how to orient your fabric for different projects. So if you keep watching a lot of my videos, you'll you'll get it down because you'll see it and hear it so many different times applied. All right. Oh, Donna says, hmm, you're making me want to try making a mini quilt uh, for my cat's bed all just for the trial. It, it, these are great little projects. If you think of a table topper, a little, even a little uh, mat to put underneath your cat's water or food bowl or your dog's water or food bowl, these are great little mini quilts that use up all the techniques of a bigger quilt, but you get to practice different things. Okay, so remember I said start and leave yourself a good bit here. So I'm gonna start somewhere close to this clip. I need to move my needle position over on this machine because remember I said I'm sewing um, a, a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Okay, so we're gonna go maybe 5.5. That's a quarter, okay. And then my stitch length, I'm gonna change it. Remember when we pieced the binding strips together, I said between two and 2.5 because it was just two layers of fabric. Now I have two layers of fabric that are folded up, right? One on top of the other because we folded over the binding strip, but then I have a whole quilt sandwich underneath it. So you wanna lengthen your stitch length. So if this is you, a newish quilter who has tried to bind your own quilts and the machine won't feed through, it's because you're now sewing, you went from patchwork, right? Just sewing a couple pieces of fabric together with the quarter inch seam to now adding it on top of an entire quilt. So depending on your make and model of machine, you may even find that you need to install the walking foot on your sewing machine. On my Jukies, even this baseline model Juki that we sell in our shop, I don't have to do any of that. So I just have the regular foot. I'm gonna start with the needle down. Remember I said I was gonna take a couple back stitches and then I'm just gonna stitch like I said. And remember, I have a dot here, but I'm going to keep sewing until I get there, which is that dot is at a quarter of an inch up from this bottom edge of the quilt. And another thing I like to do is to keep the binding strip taut. You'll see that I am holding it. I don't let it kind of bubble up and pucker up on me as it gets fed through, which can easily happen because we have so many layers. I kind of tug on it. Just make sure that it's smooth as I stitch it into place. Okay, needle down at my stopping spot, a quarter of an inch up. I'm gonna lift the knee, or the presser foot up. I'm gonna pivot my quilt. So I'm looking at the corner under here. I wanna stitch off at a 45 degree angle. Make sure I'm there. I put the presser foot back down and I'm just gonna stitch straight off. I don't have to back stitch or anything, just stitch straight off. And then I'm gonna cut my thread. Okay. So I did that one. I stitched straight off. Now when I say reposition, it means put it like this so that the next raw edge that you need to bind is going vertically in front of you, okay? So we said throw it away and then put your finger right there and fling it back to you so that that fold is now in line with my quilt and that's kind of why having the finger there helps. Perfect, all my layers are together. You can even just put a clip right there off to your side. And then we start again. And you're stitching from the edge. So we started, I'm gonna back stitch to secure that and then come back in, okay? And still with the same quarter inch. Let me get rid of all these little bits and threads because I hate for them to get caught up in my seams. All right. So now I hold my strip. Keep it nice and taut, 
and just stitch. Now, I have my stitch length set to 2.6. If your machine still feels like it's holding on to everything, lengthen it a little bit more. Go up to a 2.8 or even 3 millimeters in uh, stitch length. So again, I'm going to stop a quarter of an inch up, and I'll put a dot just so visually y'all can see. I'm good at eyeballing this, but if, whoop, it's too far over, but right there. But after you do a ton of quilts and you bind a bunch of mini quilts even, you'll start to see exactly where you need to stop. Right there, needle up, turn and pivot, come off the edge at a 45 degree angle. Take it out, cut my thread, do the same thing to the other corner. Wow, it's already 140, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Maureen says, I'm not good at eyeballing the distance. Could I measure and mark that quarter inch where I need to turn the stitch? Absolutely, I just mentioned that. <laughs> I'm glad I looked up and saw your question. So the same thing, throw it away, fling it back. Make sure that fold is in line. And I don't even need to put a clip or nothing. Once your, your fingertips get the handle on it, you'll see that you can just grab it and go. I don't even, you know, put clips or pins or nothing on my binding. I just manipulate it and attach it all by hand as I'm at the machine. And if you see any questions that I'm missing, because I'm just let me know. We got, this is going to be our third corner, then I have one more. I am going to stop right there. <laughs> and if you're off by a little, it, it'll be fine, but then you'll be able to see where the bobble was. And so like on the next one that you make, then go ahead and mark your dot or whatever, you know. Once you do it enough times, you'll you'll get a better feel for it. Same thing throw it away, swing it back. Back stitch. Okay, so now I'm coming across, oh, I still have one more corner. Let me start, let me just keep going. Because you gotta remember when we get to the end, the same way that we began by leaving a tail of binding, you gotta do that at the end too. So sometimes we get kind of into the groove while we're stitching on the binding and then you go and you stitch the whole binding down and then you have to take out a bunch of stitches because you're like, oh no, I have to leave a tail so that I can connect the two ends and finish off the binding. So here I just peek to see where my quarter inch kind of stopping point would be. There, turn, stitch off. Oh, Carol says, I'm wanting to use a striped fabric for the binding. Are there special tips? So one thing that you can do is cut off a strip and fold it in half. And that way you can see how the stripe is going to uh, play on the edge of your quilt as a binding. It's obviously going to be way thinner because we're folding the strip in half and then we stitch it and then we wrap it in half. So it gets cut down to really, really narrow. And so based on how wide or how narrow the stripes are, you'll get a totally different effect. If you were to cut your bi or if you were to cut the fabric that's a stripe across the bias, you would end up kind of like with um a totally different look. It's not going to be horizontal or vertical stripes in the binding. It's going to be at an angle. So that's kind of will give a cool effect too. Um what else? Um depending on how the stripes are printed on the fabric will affect it too. So you can have a striped fabric where the binding is going to look like the stripes go this way across the edge of your binding going horizontally across versus a fabric that might be printed in a different way where when you fold this, the vertical stripes are going up and down. And then in that case, you might lose a lot of the same kind of stripe effect depending on how thick the stripe itself is. So there's a lot that you can do with striped fabrics when it comes to binding. I would just cut yourself a little chunk of a strip, fold it in half, and kind of audition it and position it so that you can see how it's gonna turn out based on how those stripes were printed on the fabric would be the first step. All right. Oh, awesome, Barbara says she likes when I say, throw it away and bring it back down. You know, you gotta, rem you gotta say it in a way to, that people can remember. <laughs> it's like, throw it away. Um, all right, so we are, well, let's do that step next. We're gonna throw it away. 
And so here's a tip for you to, to see if you are pivoting off on the corner with that stitch at the correct angle, when you throw it away, you'll see if that was done at a 45 degree angle. So you can see where the miter is going to be. All right. And so that's what you want to see is that right there, that it's folded on that 45 degree angle. And then we fling it back. So now when I do this, I'm going to start back stitching like I've been doing, but be very careful. You see how I have a clip here and I'm holding that strip. Get rid of this. You do not want that one to stay underneath as I'm stitching across here. So now I just stitched down the corner to kind of anchor that in position, but I want to have a look and see how much room do I have here to work. So you see, this is where I started and this is where I stopped. This is plenty. I would say this is about seven or eight inches. This is good. Leave yourself that much. Do not be tempted to keep sewing, sewing, sewing here and leave yourself a smaller space. The bigger the room you have to connect these two ends, the easier it's all going to be and it's gonna turn out amazing in the end. So I'm just gonna to stitch to right here and back stitch. I'm leaving myself a good bit. Okay. Let's move this stuff out the way. Yeah, Deborah says, I see that you started your binding on the front of the quilt. That makes sense. It's the pretty side. And that way you don't deal with any of either wobbly hand stitches and stuff on the front. Some people actually do it the other way, where they will do what I just did, but to the back of the quilt and then wrap it to the front. And that way they like the look of kind of a puffier. I feel like it's more uh, pronounced when you do the binding that way. If you do an invisible stitch, then you won't see it. But if you want to uh, stitch it into place by using your sewing machine, that's it's just a different way of doing it. You know, you can do it any way you want to, but just know that there are plenty of ways, which is a good thing to keep in mind if you're new to quilting. I would hate for you to say, well, I don't want to make quilts because I can't finish it off with the quilt binding. There's a lot of different binding techniques. I'm sure there's a good one for you, you know, if you've had failed attempts before, maybe. All right. Okay. Oh, Mary says, I have a lap quilt that has been sitting simply because I was afraid to bind. You made this less frightening for me. I too love the throw it away point. Yes, give it a try. I bet you, you can absolutely finish it. And then maybe you'll feel a little bit more encouraged to tackle more whips that you have that haven't been bound or to make more quilts, right? So that you can bind them and finish them all the way off. Okay, so here's what we have, this whole chunk. And I usually work this way, so I just want to make sure. Let me trim off all these threads. So now we have two ends. One is shorter than the other, no big deal. What I care about is that I have enough fabric from both of my binding strips to overlap them. So if one is too short, you got a problem. If one, like say I go like this and I didn't have enough fabric to overlap, then we have a problem because you'll have to add additional fabric. You need to have these two overlap. So let me grab a pair of scissors, not a rotary cutter so that I don't hack into my quilt. So because I have plenty on both, okay, here's how it goes. From where I started sewing, leave myself a good bit and I'm just gonna leave this entire quilt block and then I'm gonna cut here. So I've just trimmed just a little bit away from the first strip, the one that I started off sewing. Then I'll take my next one and I'm gonna place it directly on top, okay? This is the key, key, key crucial point. The overlap of this one over this one needs to be the exact same amount that you cut the width of your fabric strip to. So remember early on I said, I like to cut my binding strips to two and a quarter inches wide. So that's what I'm dealing with here. If you cut your strips two and a half inches, this overlap needs to be two and a half inches, okay? I cut them two and a quarter. So I'm gonna pull on this, make sure it's nice and smooth. Pull on this, make sure it's nice and smooth. I want everything nice and taut. And then I grab this top strip and I'm just gonna do a little bit because I wanna see where the bottom strip is. I take my ruler and I put two and a quarter on the edge of the bottom strip right? Because that's where the overlapping starts. I need this to he from here to where I'm going to cut to be exactly the same width of the strips that I cut. Make sense? 
I did two and a quarter strips, I'm going to overlap this top one over this bottom one by two and a quarter. So two and a quarter is there. And that's where I take my scissors. I'm going to make a little snip just so that I know where it is. I can remove the ruler and keep cutting. Make sure the cut is nice and straight. So we've got rid of all the excess and we have our binding and they overlap only by the width of the strips themselves. Easy. So now let's go back to how we attach the two strips to make the one continuous binding strip. Remember that? We said take one, place it pretty side face up in front of you like a capital letter I. The next one that I wanted to join here, I said place pretty side face down to make a backwards letter L. So it's the exact same thing we've done, it's just in a tighter space. Do you see that? How this bottom one is pretty side face up, vertically, straight up and down. The next one is pretty side face down, horizontally, going like a backwards letter L. So it's the same thing, just a mini backwards letter L, okay? So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to put a pin. I'm matching up raw edges on the side and the bottom. I put a pin on this bottom corner so that I can leave everything open and smooth to draw that diagonal line same way that we did the first go around, okay? <laughs> Glenda says, OMG, holding my breath. This is where I screw it up. Well, girl, take a deep breath because when you see this, how it's going to turn out, <laughs> you're not going to be holding your breath much longer, okay? And I know that you can do this too. You just have to position it the way that I'm telling you, the same way. Make it make sense in your mind, okay? So remember that we said top right corner, to bottom left. And if you're in a tighter space than I am and you find that the strips are really struggling and moving, feel free to put a pin on the opposite of this corner. You just want to leave room here for you to draw the diagonal line. So you could put a pin here. I don't like to because if I'm not using a flat head pin, the, the little glass head here kind of lifts up my ruler and doesn't let it lie flat. So I prefer to go like this. And I'm going top right corner, peak, it's right there, bottom left. So I draw my line, and then you can go in and put a pin. Like if it's tricky for you to hold it in that place, put another pin opposite side of that line. See? It's held together. It's flat. Yes, it's a kind of a more tight little space, but you can totally do it. Now I'm going to stitch on the line. So remember we were using a quarter of an inch seam allowance before. I need to put that needle back in the middle position. I cannot have it shifted over to the side because then it won't align with the center of my presser foot. Okay, needle down, take a couple back stitches. I'm just gonna keep stitching right on my diagonal line. Quick little back stitch at the end. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> For the big reveal, and y'all know I don't care. Even if I make a mistake, I'll laugh, so it doesn't matter. But I haven't made a mistake, trust. All right, so we're going to remove our pins first. My stitches are right on the line. Everything still looks good. Nothing moved on me. Remember, place the quarter inch line. Where's my rotary cutter? Quarter inch line on the blue line that I marked and that I stitched on. And then from that line to the right, because I'm right-handed, this is just how I'm orienting my ruler and the rotary cutter, I'm going to trim away everything to the right of that, right? That's excess. So here's my quarter inch seam allowance. Let's grab my Martelli mat again, because I want to press this seam open the same way we did the first time to reduce bulk. So first I'm going to hit it with the iron, whoop, just to press it flat. Then I'm going to open this seam up. Just give it a little press with the tip of the iron. You can even finger press it. Okay. And are you ready? <laughs> this is my favorite part. If I just open my quilt, it's connected. There's no extra. Everything works out good. And I just need to come back in here and stitch to connect the beginning line of stitching here to this other side and the whole binding will be stuck exactly where it needs to be. So what I like to do is just tug on the quilt so everything lies flat and you can see it's right in line. I'm going to give this a press with my iron. Okay. 
press it with my clapper. So Susan's asking, why can't you place one on the other? Oh, I, I think I know what you're saying, like just bumping them up like pretty sides touching. When you do that, you're going to get a clunkier seam and it's just going to be chunkier because the seam is going to run directly up and down. So you're going to have seam allowance down the whole way. Whereas when we attach the two strips together on an angle, it's kind of phasing out that excess bulk and it's not a vertical seam that adds that bulk like in one spot. It's splayed out across the whole strip, if that makes sense. But if you make it like that, that's a really, that's a great way to finish off your binding too. It's just a more beginner way to do it. If we're bi mitering off corners here and here, and if you can attach it on an angle, on the 45 degree angle, to connect your strips, I absolutely then have my students do it like this. Okay, but yeah, you could do that too. It's just you're going to have a, a clear demarcation there of where the seam is going to be because it's a vertical seam versus one that's at an angle. Okay, so now let's start at the top. I'm going to, if you have a machine like me, like a basic one, you know, you got to make sure that your needle position is where you want it to be. And I think I had it at 5 or 5.5, I think like that. And then the seam is two points, or the stitch length, excuse me, is 2.6. Nope, it looks like this is where my seam was before. So I'm going to pick up. I start stitching on a few of the stitches that are already there just to kind of lock things in place with the back stitches. And then I'm going to stitch it all the way, make sure that my raw, raw edges are aligned. And then I'm going to go into those stitches by a few also and backstitch just so that you don't have a gap anywhere, you know, and things don't move on you or you have a little space where maybe stitches aren't overlapping. Just overlap them by a few at the beginning and at the end as you connect those two seams together. Ta-da! Get rid of these threads. So now... The one side of the binding has been <laughs> sewn into place. If you're not a quilter, you're probably like, you're still not done. <laughs> and so now I go in here and I just kind of turn my project and push the binding away from the quilt so that I have no fabric bubbling up inside there. I want everything smooth and being pushed away because this is going to get wrapped around this raw edge, okay, around the seam allowance that we just left. Look at that. That's the bottom where we joined the strip. Okay? Nice and smooth, no bubbling there. You know what I'm talking about when you go to join them if you have too much excess in there in the overlap, it ends up like having like too much fabric that you can't smooth out and stitch into place. All right. Oh, Mary says I wish I had watched this 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 morning when I was working on some pot holders. You can always take the binding off, Mary, and just reattach it. Luckily, binding is just some thin strips of fabric, so even if it doesn't work out the first time, keep trying it, especially with these small quilt projects. Look how fun. I know a lot of you were like, uh, what is she doing with orange fabric? Y'all know me. I have a thing for color, and I know it's going to work out, <laughs> even if the colors don't match necessarily. All right, so now on the corners, I just kind of tuck the corners of the quilt in and plop this back. I'll do the same thing to the other side. Just kind of push up on the little bits of the corner, okay? How cute! Okay, so then the back of the binding needs to be attached somehow. I'm going to do mine by machine, and I'll probably just share a picture once I stick this up on the wall after we get done here since we are pulling up on 2 o'clock already. An hour binding a mini quilt. Trust me, if you do it at home, it shouldn't take you this long. It's just because I'd be talking a lot. Okay, so a couple different, well, a lot of different ways to do this, but for a mini quilt that I'm going to throw up on the wall, I will typically glue baste it and then just machine stitch it unless I'm really in the mood to sit down, you know, at night on the couch and just do some hand stitching. But quick way to do it. I'm just using washable white Elmer's glue. Simple. You can get this at any corner store in the U.S. at least. The tip that I have on here, uh, my friend Laura sells in her Etsy shop. It's just a different metal tip that makes it so that the glue flows out of here a lot thinner than just the regular bottle, okay? But if you don't have the tip, you know, you can make this work too. Just be very, very light-handed. You're just going to put a couple dots. You can do it on the back of the quilt. You can do it on the binding itself, 
okay? I'm going to use my glue tip. We're going to put a, a link in the chat box if you're watching us here so that you can order the little tip if you want from Laura, but you can see barely anything. It's a super, super fine uh, little line. So I'm just going to put a little bit there, and then I'm going to wrap it around the edge of my quilt. Now, I'm not hitting the steam function on my iron because I don't want to add more moisture, right? The glue is a liquid. So I just want to add the heat of the dry iron so that it sets and dries that glue in place like that, okay? And this is a helpful way to kind of prep your quilt bindings. If you are going on a trip, you're going to be in the car and you don't want to have a bunch of pins or clips all the way around your quilt for hand stitching, take a couple minutes the night before, glue it down, and then take it with you because when it's glued in place, it's there temporarily until you wash this or until you pull this up. So technically, if you really wanted to hack it, you could just glue base the binding and throw this thing up on the wall. Nobody's going to know that <laughs> they're going to know. No, nobody's really going to know that, um, that you didn't actually stitch it into place. So that's another quick way. If you just need a quick binding to be done on the quilt for photography or to throw it up on a wall that it's not actually going to be used, this is a great way to do it. And I like when I'm taking quilts to hand stitch the binding on, on a trip or something, I do it like this because I don't have any extra weight, clips, or pins in my way. Okay? So you can see how it just stays there. Now when we get to the corners, it's basically you fold, 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 fold all the way till you get to the corner. Okay? When you get to the corner, you just keep folding until you can't fold no more. All right. And when you can't fold anymore, that means, hey, you've reached an opposite edge. And now this whole edge is going to get folded over. And so that is where you see that 45 degree angle of the miter. Those steps that I showed you how to do where you stop a quarter of an inch up, pivot, stitch across, then throw it away and bring it back to you. All those steps, this is what it yields you. 45 degree angle there so that when I bring it back, it'll give me a 45 degree uh, mitered corner at the binding on the front and the back, okay? So that's what that's for. Now, <clears throat> same thing. Add my line of, of very, very fine glue. You'll see, and this just on a big quilt, ooh, this works out super good because you can do a long expanse really quickly. All right, so quarter inch. Let me fold that corner so it stays whoop, stays down. And then I'm going to bring my binding over as I just use the heat, dry heat of the iron to hold this whole thing down. I mean, come on. How else are you going to keep that binding there so, that fast, right? Super, super cute. Thank you, Mickey. I've been thinking about you, girl. I hope all is well. All right. So... Next one, this little bit, and I'm just going to keep it like this. I'm going to show you all the finished one since we're already over time, but I am going to go in and, and machine stitch it. Maybe I'll do another demo on how I do machine stitching my binding in an upcoming Whip Wednesday episode. Perfect. Glue dot in the corner and a super fine line. If your glue doesn't dry, you probably got the steam function on. You don't want to add more moisture, okay? Just the heat so that it sets. Oh, no. Donna says, every kind of glue I buy, I have many. Just a mess every time. Try this technique, Donna. You might just need the tip and some really cheap white washable Elmer's glue. As you can see, I mean, it really... Because the, the tip is so fine that you would really have to just hold it in one spot and really, really squeeze in order to get a lot of glue out. So if that is the mess that you usually have, because a lot of glue comes out, then I highly recommend ordering these glue tips from my friend Laura's uh, Etsy shop. And we put a link to her shop in the chat box below. Okay, we're on the last side. And then we're going to, once I'm done with this, you can put them on my face so I can hold it up. Because I think you can see the, um, oh, let me put the glue on the outer edge a little bit more so that it, when I flip this over it grabs here and doesn't just get lost in the um, in the fold and a little bit there to hold this miter down oh this orange I love it 
such a great pop of color. And if you have a bold fabric like this in your stash and you're thinking, uh, probably not going to be great for binding, try it out. Because when you look at it in yardage, it's a big chunk. Remember that the binding is just going to be a really thin strip. So sometimes a fabric that you don't like in a big chunk that you're looking at works out perfectly to just give you that little trim that we need in our bindings. So let me finish off this corner. Do this side to hold it down. And then let's do this miter here. And because the glue is being dried, it will hold. I mean, this binding will hold here, obviously temporarily, because if it gets wet, the glue is washable and it's not gonna hold. But like I said, if you're just gonna throw it up uh, on the wall or you're using it as a table topper or something and you don't really, you know, no, and you know that it's not gonna get handled as much, you can totally <laughs> just glue it. Oh my gosh, how cute. Okay, let's switch them to my face. How cute! I just obviously got to give it a good press to the front of these quilt blocks since the quilting is only in the gray areas. But you see how cute that orange looks and how it's going to look against my light aqua colored walls. I'm super happy. And you know what? I might not even stitch this down. I might just put my little 3M command things. You can see that even glue basting the binding, it's going to hold it there. For what I need and for my purposes, I don't even think I need to stitch it, which is going to be great because then uh, there's not going to be any stitches here. If I do it by machine, obviously the stitches will show on the front, right? And if I don't use a thread that matches exactly, it's going to kind of take away from the pop of the orange, I think, because you'll see stitches on it. I could go in and hand stitch it to the back now after it's been glue basted because I don't have to have clips to hold it in place. So that helps too. But like I said, since I'm going to just throw it up on the wall, I think I'm just going to do my little 3M command thing and throw it up there. Now, if you want a tutorial on how I hang up my mini quilts, and I use this exact same method, whether I'm hanging them on drywall, like painted wall or concrete, um, if you have a cinder block wall in your studio or something and you want to hang up your quilts without having to drill through it, I have a method that has worked for me for years on all of them. And all you got to do is go to YouTube and type in how to hang a mini quilt, Crafty Gemini. Uh, my tutorials, if you ever use the keywords Crafty and Gemini, my tutorials that I've done on any topic that you're searching will pop up. So if you type in how to hang a mini quilt, Crafty Gemini, that tutorial will pop right up. Okay, so Tamara says, I love the magic of this binding technique. It really is easy, straightforward, and the more mini quilts you make, the easier it's going to be to practice the techniques, especially mitering four corners, because you still got to miter four corners, whether it's a king size quilt or a little mini quilt, right? So you can practice on a smaller quilt, getting those techniques down, and then it's going to help make it a lot easier when you have to bind a larger quilt, all right? So I hope that you all enjoyed this demo today, Whip Wednesday number 57. I will be back next Wednesday with another other demo and um, it is this is a mini quilt from the clammy quilt club somebody's asking I did make this um, these blocks with the clammy ruler and we do have clammy rulers still in stock so if you're looking for a ruler that allows you to cut and piece together curved quilt blocks definitely check that out and there's my little mini quilt Awesome. Now I just need to pick another spot on my wall to hang this one up. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in this week. I will see you actually this Friday. If you're into all things yarn and fiber, I have an episode of Fiber Fridays. Every first Friday of each month, I go live at 7 p.m. to talk about yarn and fiber. And this week we have some awesome stuff because our sheep have been shorn. I met up with the mill. She is, uh, the lady that runs the mill is starting to process our wool. I process a little chunk of it myself just to kind of go through the steps. So I'll be sharing that process with you. I'll share a little bit of my spinning technique with you and, um, I've made some socks. So I have a lot of stuff to talk about for Fiber Friday this week. And if you're not into that stuff, then I'll just be back next Wednesday for another episode of Whip Wednesday. All right. Have a great rest of your week and enjoy your weekend, everybody. I hope you find some time to do something crafty.